Good evening, I'm Desiree Frazier, senior reporter in the news department here at Mississippi Public Broadcasting and the moderator for this evening's event. Welcome to our virtual screening and panel discussion of the PBS documentary, Mysteries of Mental Illness. And thank you so much for joining us. This documentary is a four part series that explores the evolution and understanding the difficulties surrounding mental illness and the dramatic attempts across generations to unravel many important questions such as what causes it and how is it best treated. Mysteries of Mental Illness aired on MPB television last week, but you can still watch or stream the entire series online by searching for it at video.mpbonline.org or find it on the PBS video app. We will be joined by four of the state's top leaders in mental health for a live panel discussion. Dr. Joy Hogue, Executive Director of Families as Allies. Dr. Susan Buttress with the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Wendy Bailey, Executive Director of the Mississippi Department of Mental Health. And Satanyal Wembley, Executive Director of NAMI Mississippi. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We just heard from four people living with a range of mental conditions, post-traumatic stress disorder, hypochondria, schizophrenia, obsessive compulsive disorder. Briefly, what stood out to each of you, if anything, from hearing their stories? And I'll begin with Joy Hogue. Well, first of all, <clears throat> excuse me, thank you, Desiree for um, facilitating this tonight and thanks to MPB for having us here. I think the thing that most struck me was that um, I'm excited to be on this panel, but it has hit me that we really don't have the real experts on here because we don't have, as far as I know, people who are actually experiencing mental illness on the panel. And what most struck me as I listened to them is that they were the experts because listening to what they had to say and their perspectives and what they could tell us about their needs would tell us more than um, anything that we could come up with without them um, giving that point of view. Any thoughts from anyone else? Dr. Buttress? Yeah, one of the, one of the real striking pieces um, was the struggle that every single person had um, struggling with trying to figure out what was wrong with them. Um, it sounded like they had such difficulty getting help. Um, it sounded like um, they were accused of being abnormal without anybody offering any kind of explanation or help. Uh, that kind of struggle happens all the time. And you heard also the delay in treatment how long, we know the sooner we intervene, the better, and how long it took, um, a long time, 15 years for one, way too long. And so for me, I would say the first thing that I noticed watching it was the story was told by the people who needed to tell it. My organization is a peer-led organization, so these are the stories that I'm hearing. But often when we go into these meetings, into these rooms that make the decisions, those people are not the people at the table. So I was pleasantly pleased and surprised to see that that's who was telling the stories because that's how we stop the stigma and show what mental health really looks like. Wendy Bailey, anything to add? I agree with all the previous statements. What Satanial was just saying, their they're peer to peer, their trainings, um, and then certified peer support specialist in our state. To me, what, what stuck out was that each individual had their own personal story. It doesn't matter if they have a similar diagnosis or the same diagnosis. They have their own personal story and their own personal journey and their own personal road to recovery for them. And, and they're all unique and they're all different. And I think that's something that um, no matter what area or what that we work in or what position we work in is something that we have to keep in the forefront of our minds is that everybody's an individual and it's their own personal story. Are there certain mental illnesses that are more prevalent in Mississippi than others? What conditions do you see, Dr. Buttress? Oh gosh. Um, Across anxiety, range? Um, yeah, and 
uh, keep in mind, I predominantly see children. Um, and I will say that one of the issues that I see often is anxiety. Anxiety is one of those that is so prevalent in the teenage population right now. And in fact, after COVID-19, we're seeing upwards of, um, gosh, 40% of individuals with anxiety. Of course, ADHD is common, OCD is common, depression has jumped significantly. Um, and certainly the ad adult population seems to, to mimic exactly what happens to children. Um, I think in the chat box, um, while we were watching the video, you probably noticed several, several people talked about the fact that symptoms start early, start often in young children, now it's schizophrenia and later adolescence, but anxiety, depression, OCD, all of those start appearing in younger children, maybe more subtly, but then they get bigger. And I agree, by the way, with everybody's comment, it is we have got to have people who are struggling talk about their struggles and, and, and demand um, that help comes sooner and that we quit treating mental illness like it's something that's different than a physical illness because it's not. It's a brain illness, um, just like a liver illness or a cardiac illness or a lung. Um, we've got it. The brain is the organ that controls our body and we need to treat it as well as we treat other organ. So I know, sorry, I went off on a tangent. But no, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Wendy Bailey, um, Mississippi Department of Mental Health, you must see a wide range, I assume, of cases differing um, disorders. We do. It's a wide range. Um, as Dr. Butcher said, there's a lot of cases of depression and anxiety, but more severe mental illnesses as well. Um, one startling thing that we are seeing right now, and I think a lot of that has to do with the, the pandemic that we've been in for the last year and a half, almost a year and a half, even though that sounds unbelievable, um, is an is a increase in calls that we are seeing to both the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, and I noticed that Brenda Patterson is actually on here tonight, and she operates one of the call centers for the Lifeline in Mississippi. But um, seeing an increase in those calls and seeing an increase in our DMH helpline calls as well. And it's not just an increase in the number of calls, it's an increase in the length of the time on the calls and the severity of the calls. So while we see a wide range of different diagnoses, we, we also are seeing an increase in that right now, especially with people seeking help which is good because it's increasing help seeking behaviors and you want people to reach out and you want people to call. Um, I think one exciting thing that, that happened nationally and is, is coming to Mississippi as well is that 988 initiative where instead of 911, you'll be able to call 988 for a behavioral health crisis. And that's gonna link you to the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline as well. Because as, as one of the stories in the film that we just watched. I mean, um, suicidal ideation is real and you need help immediately. And you need to know that it's safe to reach out and that you can. And um, I, I, I just know that's something that we're seeing is that increase in, in those calls and the severity of those. Okay, anyone have anything to add to that? Well, according to the State Department of Mental Health, there are more than 430,000 Mississippians living with mental illness. One thing each person mentioned in the video, and uh, Dr. Buttress, you alluded to this, they kept it a secret. They didn't tell anybody and they suffered in silence. How do you break that and how common is it? If you don't mind, I'll start because that's one thing that, you know, I do the radio show, relatively speaking, and um, we talk about mental behavioral health issues. And, and I've, I've often joked that people call in to the other Southern Remedy shows and talk about 
their colon issues or talk about their lung issues or their skin issues, but people are resistant to talking about their mental health issues. And we have got to get over the stigma. We have got to convince people that it is okay. And it does not mean that you're not as smart or not as strong or not as capable. So I, I think we have a lot of work to do. And, and we, I, I've been so heartened over the last few years. It's been interesting, the numbers of calls have increased because people are getting more comfortable talking about that, but I still think we have a long way to go. I, I'm sure that, that the others here who work so much with families can add to that. Yes, what I would say is um, for us, we do a lot of community education programs. Um, just have the conversation. Going into schools and talking about mental health and mental wellness, going into businesses, just having others to share their stories, just as this documentary did. We have a lot of people on, in the state of Mississippi who go out and they share their stories. And at the end, there's a question and answer session. And what I've noticed is when we go into the room, usually it's kind of closed off. It's a little scared of the subject because of course it's mental health. But by the end of the conversation, everyone is willing to share, everyone is open, and everyone is more interested to learn because we've basically broken those barriers and said, it's okay that you're not okay. And I think the more we do that, the easier it'll be for us to have these conversations and get more people treated in the state. Well, I do know, um, I have two friends that I grew up with who developed bipolar disorder. Um, one of them would tell people, her friends, other friends about her disorder, and then they wouldn't talk to her anymore. They would make excuses not to deal with her. And that made her clam up and not tell anybody anything. So how do we get people to stop having that type of reaction when you share? Desiree. I think one thing that's important to remember, and I agree with what everyone's saying about stigma, and it's important to address this from that angle, but we also need to look at if we just address this from that angle, we're putting a lot of pressure on that person. They need to get to the point where we talk about this, and we need to create a way where it's easier for people to just get the help they need, even if they can't verbalize it, and I would say even if they don't even realize they have a problem with mental illness. So the more that like, and we work with children, the more we can get services and supports out where children already are, like in schools and helping teachers understand um, how to identify things early, not to make them therapists, but to help them have the knowledge they need and support in classrooms so that things can be dealt with early on out in primary care practices. Um, pediatricians, which I know Dr. Budras is, and things like that. And then also, in, we need to not just talk about stigma, we need to realize this is an area of discrimination. So we need to treat the way your friend, your friend was treated, we need to treat that as a type of discrimination, just as we would with any other type of discrimination, and really educate people that that is discrimination just as if they were doing that based on someone's sex or race. So I think reframing the conversation is important. Okay. I do want to get to access to care, but we have one question about how many of those incarcerated and unhoused in Mississippi are mentally ill. Um, unhoused, not sure how many in Mississippi. I can tell you that um, the Mental Health Prison Policy Initiative this is nationwide, says that the percent of people in state and federal prisons who have been diagnosed with a mental illness is more than 37%. In locally run jails, it's 44%. The number of people experiencing serious psychological distress in jails is more than one in four. Do you have any experience uh, with folks that are incarcerated and trying to get them help? Do they get help? Can, who can tell us about that? And well, my, heart, 
Go ahead, Dr. Butchers. Well, Satanial, I'll tell mine, I'll make it short, but um, I, I have a lot of experience in the juvenile justice system um, from a, a, a clinical project I was asked to participate in on fetal alcohol spectrum, children who were exposed to alcohol um, during pregnancy, their mothers drank during pregnancy. And we were supposed to go into the juvenile justice system and screen children who were incarcerated um, to see how many of those children had it been had fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. And I was stunned at the number who screened out as positive. So many of those children exposed to alcohol have um, emotional issues, behavioral control issues, and significant learning problems. And instead of helping them, they ended up in within the juvenile justice system. Um, very depressing. I think we're doing a very bad job. So Satanial, I know you have some further comments on that, but, but we're starting early, not doing the right thing. And I would just want to agree with Dr. Buttress. What we are seeing is I probably get two or three calls a week from a family member whose family member is incarcerated, not receiving the treatment. Um, they don't have any information about what's going on once the family member is taken into custody. And there's just a frantic family member trying to help the person that they know needs help. So we do have a major problem in that area. And it kind of breaks my heart for the state because what do you tell them? We, we do our best to give them resources, but once that person is in, it's even more stressful for the family and for that person, especially if they're, they don't have access to treatment. Wendy Bailey, Bailey do you, just, go yes, ahead. I think Satine, you'll just hit the nail on the head. Um, it's, it's, it's preventing them from entering the system too, it, it, the, the justice system and, and um, the prison system. I think that's, there's, there's several different pieces to the puzzle. And that is one of them. There's a, there's a story a lot of times you'll hear in presentations about um, a person who is, is drowning in the river and crying out for help. And this man pulls them out and resuscitates them. And a few seconds later, there's another person drowning in the river and he pulls them out, and resuscitates them. And the whole point is who's at the other end of the river looking to see why these people are in the river. And that's that, that prevention piece. Um, I think that's where crisis intervention training, law enforcement training, but mobile crisis response where it's mental health professionals responding and not law enforcement, um, diversion centers where you have someone who maybe is nonviolent and it's a non-felony offense and instead of taking them to jail, they're taken to a diversion center where they can um, receive help and care. It's it's those things on the front end for people who do not need to be in jail either. Um, and, and their mental illness may be part of it and it, and it may not be. Um, but receiving that on the front end um, is important. And then, um, I know I'm jumping from the front end to the back end, but there's, there was some legislation this year specifically about individuals as they're leaving the correctional system and making sure they are connected with a mental health provider and they have access to the services and the supports and if they need medication, the medication that they need um, as they're leaving the correctional system to where they don't re-enter it and they have that support. So you've got work on the front end that needs to be done. You've got work on the back end that needs to be done and then services in the middle as well. But um, I think there's a lot of pieces to that puzzle that can, that can be put together with everyone at the table. Okay. And talking about access to care, um, Wendy Bailey, Mississippi was sued by the State Department of Justice in 2016 because of a lack of community-based services and a reliance on state hospitals. The DOJ won that lawsuit in 2019. A federal judge is following the steps your department is taking a remediation plan to ensure Mississippi complies with court orders. Now, last month, your agency submitted a report to the judge saying sufficient changes have been made. Briefly, tell us about that, please. Okay. I, can, I can absolutely talk about some of those, those services and supports, especially some over the last, um, say, 
18 months um, since, since the hearing occurred. Um, we, one of our main focuses is to try to get intensive supports in the community and a range of that. So looking at PAC teams, which are programs of assertive community treatment, um, which is a team of people to wrap around an individual to help keep them in the community and prevent readmissions. Um, and then there's also a modified version of a PAC team called an i -Corp, which is intensive community outreach and recovery teams. And it's for more rural areas of the state as well. Um, there's also intensive community support services, which we refer to as ICSS. And one of our goals was to have one of those three services available in every county in the state. And we know there's some very rural areas in Mississippi, but they still need services and supports. Um, and that was one of the, of the reasons to try to have that in all 82 counties. And that's been implemented and started to implement over this last year. I think having those key areas um, to support someone to prevent them going back to the hospital is, um, is very important. Peer support, um, having someone that has lived experience and has been through um, what you are going through is so very important and is, is absolutely a key. Um, having mobile crisis teams respond to a crisis situation that's made up of mental health professionals. And we have um, those in all of the community mental health center regions now. Uh, we've increased the number of crisis stabilization beds and have plans to increase that by more. There's 176 crisis stabilization beds in the state now. And that's short term stays and intensive care um, but it has a 91% diversion rate from a state hospital, which is what you want. Your last resort and your last option should be a state hospital bed. That's the last place we want someone. We want someone served in their community with the services that they need. Um, and there's areas in the state where it's stronger. And then there's areas in the state that we're trying to build those services up by working with the community mental health centers which is there's 13 of those in the state and they're operated by local county government. So it's trying to have that relationship and work with local county government as well um, to, to solve some of these, these issues and to, to strengthen that. Some of the other keys in that was supported employment and supported housing and um, a meaningful day and having access to housing and having access to employment is, um, is very important. We have, we're adding three more supported employment sites this next um, fiscal year following an evidence-based practice and there's going to be additional housing slots available as well. So there's been a lot of moving and a lot that still needs to happen as well. Do you have the funding that you need for it? We shifted um, funding from our state hospitals several years ago, well a couple years ago, and that's how we increased some of the crisis stabilization beds. Um, one, one good thing is we've recently received additional funding from the federal government through the COVID funds. So it's right at about $40 million and it will all go to community services. Now, part of that will go to substance abuse, but then also adult and children mental health. We're waiting on our final proposals to be approved by um, the federal government, but that's $40 million that'll be coming. It's it's one-time money, it's non-reoccurring, but we'll be coming to the state to help support and build up those community services. Okay, Joy Ho, you've been following the litigation and advocating for families. How do you feel about access to care in the state? Well, um, my perspective's a little different and Wendy and I work together and um, I have great respect for her and she knows, and we've talked about a lot of these issues, but I agree that there have been some changes and some services added and that's good. But I would just ask everyone who's out there listening to this, who knows someone with a mental illness, is that person able to get the services and supports that they need to be able to live in the community if they want to? And 
that's not happening on a holistic basis in Mississippi. And there's still plenty of people who are in jail or on the streets or getting services that don't match their needs. And the whole point of that lawsuit goes back to civil rights and people's right to live in the community if they want to. And I, there's not evidence that people are being able to do that to the um, extent that we want them to. So that would be an element, Wendy Bailey, that you would be working on addressing more? You, you will never hear me say that the system is perfect. It is not. Um, it, 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 there's always room for growth and there's always room for improvement. And you can't do that without different voices and different people at the table. So many that are commenting now um, mm -hmm. that, I mean, that's the way we have to do it. Um, and I believe there has been much progress and there are many more services and supports that are going to be coming out in the next year. I just think one of the most important things is that we that we keep that focus on that person and that individual person and what they need. Um, and, and when there are those gaps and when there are those issues, like Joy just referred to as well, that those are brought to someone's attention, that it's reported that someone knows about it. Um, I mean, that's, that's key as well. So it can be addressed and be corrected. So Tanya, you work with families as well. Your thoughts? Um, I, I I see it on both sides. We are in the state of Mississippi and I can say change is slow. Um, all we can do at this point from our end is we support the families and connect them with the services that we know exist. Some of the problem that I've noticed with families is and families and the individuals is they don't even know some of the services exist. And then there are other barriers such as transportation, um, things like insurance. So those are also barriers that stop individuals from getting the help that they actually need. Okay, Dr. Buttress, what do you see? I'm sure you refer people and that type of thing. We're trying to connect them with services at some point, I would think. Absolutely. And one of the biggest issues I have is that when we have very young children who start having difficulty with behavior um, early on, under six, the services are just not there. They are so limited in this state. Our Center um, uh, for the Advancement of Youth at UMC is one of the few centers who serves children under the age of five. Um, and that's not acceptable. Uh, the other thing that we see is that um, from uh, uh, help when you really need intensive help for young teens, that there are no services there. Um, so if we would only, I think it's been said several times on the many of the different programs that you have had on this series, is that the earlier you intervene, the better. And we keep trying to put out fires at the end of life rather than at the beginning. And if we would only do that, we have got to expand our child services from, from the age, um, and I mean it, from behavioral health. We have three and four-year-olds getting kicked out of their preschool for their behavioral issues. And then the families can't get any help. Typically, it's the parents who need help with the management. And if we would only be able to do that, I'm happy to hear about the wraparound services that we are expanding. We know that home visiting, that my pack where you go into the homes and you help can make a huge difference. If we would just start earlier, rather than I, I, I think Satanio and others have mentioned, um, <laughs> how so many times the first thing we think about doing is suspending kids or calling the juvenile justice system when if we give help to the parents and help to the kids early, that would never happen and we wouldn't have the incarceration rate we have. So the earlier the better. What is the cost like for treatment? I know we're in the poorest state in the nation, but what does it cost for a counseling session? on average? So first of all, I just want to jump in and say the cost of counseling and 
any other mental health services as an outpatient are a whole lot cheaper than as an inpatient and a whole lot cheaper than incarceration. So, um, you know, we can get into the individual cost and depending on what, but it's not that costly if you look at good, appropriate evidence-based treatment. Now, there, there are some not great treatments out there. Um, so I think it'd be important to make sure that when our children and adults get treatment, that it's good evidence-based treatment and it's not all about medication, medication when needed, but um, there are many, many child therapies out there and adolescent therapies that don't require expensive high-powered medicines. Okay, we do have a question. What can I do if beds and meds are not what I need? Um, that sounds like it might be a counseling issue. I don't know. Does that resonate with anyone? I think one thing that um, can be really helpful and that we alluded to at the beginning of this discussion is peer support. And Wendy brought that up too, is um, getting that support and help from somebody who's been in your shoes and navigated that same journey and knows what it's like and can share um, things that work for them and resources that they found. I think that's extremely helpful. And some of the more informal services and supports like on the adult side, drop-in centers for adults, that it doesn't have to always be some mental health professional that you're going to, but different ways to get that support from each other. The same thing from families. Um, and then I was just gonna tag on to something Dr. Buttress said, evidence-based treatments are very important when you're looking at formal clinical services. And it's not just that the service is evidence-based, but that the person who is providing it is qualified to do it and has the right credentials and has actually been trained to do it. It hasn't just gone to some weekend seminar somewhere. So just okay. that. Okay. And and I would like to add to that, um, I often get calls from people who are not satisfied with the care that they're receiving. It's important for those individuals to understand that they employ their physician. If someone is speaking to you in a condescending way, you're not comfortable sharing with them, that's not necessarily the therapist for you. You need someone who understands, is evidence-based, and is not just wanting to give you meds and beds, <laughs> as you put it. I mean, I have been in a situation as a caregiver where I had a, a, a therapist talking to me, asking me questions about my family member who was in the room with me. And I literally had to say, they're right there. It's not my body. Those are not my feelings. I don't know. You need to ask this individual. And that's where it goes back to where Joy says that's discrimination. As an adult, everyone should be able to get services. And when you get the courage to get your services and go into that appointment, you should be treated like an individual and you should be respected as if you know exactly what you're talking about because it's your body. Okay. Your thoughts on expanding Medicaid, does it include mental health services? Anyone? Absolutely. It has got to expand mental health services. I think... We need Medicaid, we need Medicaid um, expansion for families. There is no question about it. Um, people know that if they go um, to almost any therapy, any kind of treatment, they're gonna have to pay for it. And that is one of the big barriers in getting appropriate treatment the other thing that we have to remember, and I noticed in the chat box that there was a comment about trying to access therapy, but then the only time therapy was available was during work hours or school hours. And okay. so then they, they can't get to it. So we've got to do something to, to figure out how to better serve the population in need. Um, one of it is, is definitely mental health parity. They keep saying we have mental health parity. Um, it's not legal to have physical health covered better than mental health, but I keep hearing that there's still problems, there's still barriers. Are you seeing that, Wendy, in what you do? 
And, and it goes back to Dr. Buttress just said, looking at, at different ways that treatment can be provided um, and different avenues um, and tying back into the, to the beds and meds. I mean, there's so many different supports out there and services out there. I think um, tying in and looking at that coping strategies for an individual, I was talking to a peer just the, a few nights ago about RAP. I mean, wellness recovery action plans, absolutely phenomenal. I have a wrap plan for myself. I mean, it is a great tool. There's a lot of tools in the toolbox that are outside of medication and beds um, that I think we need to bring more attention to and more of a focus on um, that are, are underutilized. Okay, we have another question. How do you think the stress of poverty in our state contributes to mental illness here, separate from the lack of access to care? Who'd like to take that on? I'll say something. I think that's huge. And if people can't get their base, just think about it for any of us. If we're hungry, right. don't have housing, if we're worried about having a job, that's going to affect our mental health. And if you're already dealing with a mental illness, it's going to make it that much worse. And I think along with that, what can we do besides meds and beds? It's really important to think about that, especially with adults. Like how do we help people who are struggling with a mental illness to do the same things that all adults typically like to do, like to live in a house and live where they want to live and not where they're told to live and have a job if they want to be employed. We know if people want to be employed, that one of the best things we can do if they have a mental illness, regardless of where they are with that mental illness, is to help them be employed. So that's important. And that also helps address some of the ways that poverty affects all of this. Okay. Anyone else on that one? Yeah, I'll tag on to that. Um, you know, back in the early 1990s, a study was done by Kaiser Permanente in California looking at adverse childhood experiences and how one turned out as an adult. And it was a phenomenal, phenomenal study that we talk about today. And we know that um, they looked at nine different adverse experiences, having mental illness in the home, um, living in poverty, um, having the loss of a family member, struggling in several different ways. But what, what was found from that study is even middle-class individuals had a higher incidence of many health issues, including stroke, cardiac disease, asthma, um, in addition to more a higher incidence of depression and other issues if they were exposed to some of those adverse childhood experiences. So, so yes, food security, um, being able to live in a house and not worry about where you're gonna sleep are also very important to the stability of your mental health, no doubt about it. In our state, which is a conservative state, um, faith-based communities are important in people's lives. Are you finding that there is support there? What kind of uh, support, if any, are you seeing coming from faith-based communities? We've recently, I'm sorry, do you wanna go, Wendy? No, you go ahead. First lesson. Okay, I'll talk fast. Um, we've seen something exciting at Families as Allies. We facilitate the Hines County MAP team, which is a making a plan team and it's funded through the Department of Mental Health. We really appreciate that. And these teams are across the state and they're interagency groups that come together with families to make sure children who are at risk for coming out of the home have every opportunity to stay with their family and in their community. And we have, and this may be happening with other MAP teams, I don't know, but we've recently had an influx of faith-based partners who are working with our MAP team. And a lot of times they're the ones who know where the families who are really struggling are. And then they have some on the kind of grassroots level resources that we might not know about, but we can bring that together with a more formal systems. And it's just been absolutely terrific. And it's really just kind of a microcosm of what should be happening all the time, but it's been absolutely wonderful. And I'm very grateful to our faith partners on that. Okay, Wendy. I, I, and Matt team's excellent example of it. I mean, I think the faith-based community is getting more and more involved and wanting to learn more. 
one of a, a, a very large church in the Metro Jackson area um, reached out for some training on suicide prevention for, for young adults and kind of a mental health first aid modified version for, for um, youth. And the day that we went in to do the training, they had had a suicide in their youth group the night before. Mm. Um, I think more and more are realizing um, we are the people that our congregation comes to, not necessarily the mental health professionals and, and, and not the call line numbers. And it, they go to their pastor or their Sunday school teacher or someone in their class. And I, I think that they're seeing more and more that role that they can play in it. Um, we, we recently did a, a governor's challenge for veterans and active service members in Mississippi and um, uh, Melody, who's actually um, participating, it was one of the people on, um, on the work group for the state. And one of the reoccurring comments was peer support and faith-based community. I mean, that if you don't have the faith-based community involved, you're just, you're missing out on a, a strong connector there of someone that people feel safe going to and safe talking to. Okay. Speaking about a strong connection for the African-American church, it's central to that community. So Sataniel, can you speak to what you're seeing from the African-American uh, faith-based community? It's very diversified, a lot of denominations. What are you seeing that you can speak to? We are starting to see more um, churches be open to us in the past, pre-COVID a lot of them wouldn't have touched the subject, but now we are starting to have pastors who are coming forth and sharing their stories with us and asking us how to share their stories. Um, when we do conferences, we make a point to invite faith-based leaders. And over the past two years, every conference, we've had someone to bring in a session and it aligns with their faith. So I think it's very important um, in the African American community, they're the pillars of the community in most in most areas. So to have those as allies is just going to be a great support system for the community. When African Americans, I can say, don't necessarily trust outside entities, they can trust their churches, and that's where they lean to. So we want to support the churches and give them the knowledge and the support that they need, so that they know where to send their congregation. So that everyone is able to get help. Okay, and we saw that with vaccinations, um, COVID-19 vaccinations, the African-American church was instrumental in getting people out to be vaccinated. We have another question. What can we do to get more personal stories of recovery out there? You can be trained as an in our own voice presenter with NAMI Mississippi. We teach you how to tell your story. We teach you a um, elevator spiel and we can help you find a location to share the story. If you're not wanting to share your own story, call us, we'll send someone out to share their story. This year alone, we trained about 34 individuals to share their story. So they're just waiting for someone to listen. All right, more personal stories. How about uh, Joy with your organization? Well, um, you know, we're a peer run, family run organization, so you have a lot of personal stories. Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, and so I think um, connecting with an organization that's run by your peers like NAMI or the Association of Mississippi Peer Support Specialists, um, Families as Allies, can be a real great start. And then to actually go through training, um, peer support training, is also really good for um, populations. We do it for families. And I think those are just some places to start. I also think it's important to realize it's not just the story itself. There's definitely a place for those stories. And we've all seen tonight how moved we were and how much yes. this affected us. But it's even more the lived experience that person has because of what they've gone through, regardless of whether or not you ever know their story, they have expertise and perspective that nobody else has. So that's the really critical thing and valuing that. And I would say things like what MPB is doing tonight really help too. And I am grateful that um, the media 
in Jackson and Mississippi seems to be um, more and more open and in fact, eager to get the word out about mental health. So I think that helps too. Well, it's a pleasure to be able to do it. Have you found self-medicating with illegal drugs is common, uh, Dr. Buttress? Absolutely. And in fact, again, during COVID, we all have been mentioning COVID. Um, you've seen it across the news. There has been an increased incidence in, in alcohol use and other drug use um, during this because people are additionally stressed and dealing with um, not having the support structure that they typically had, not having the friends and not having the community um, that they typically have. So yes, we know it's a, a terrible way uh, to self-medicate and often you get into other health issues and, and additional sleep issues in addition to perhaps even personality changes. Um, and then increased neglect. So it's kind of been a ripple effect. So it's a terrible way. Um, that's why it's so important for us to have all the services that Department of Mental Health and the NAMI and Families as Allies, all of that is so very important. Um, in addition to being able to have access to the medical services whenever needed. So yeah, I would encourage um, all of our all of our listeners tonight are participants to to remember not not to self medicate it it doesn't work and in fact it causes increased issues. Is there any benefit to medical marijuana in some instances? Maybe um, you know there are definitely some studies going on that um, have shown that it may have benefits certainly. Um, one of our neurologists has been working on a study, for example, for seizure disorders. There has been some work with mood disorders also and anxiety. But again, I would encourage everybody to, to not self-medicate, but to reach out to um, the experts who are really looking into this and know, you know, sometimes the unintended consequences of what seems like it might be something good that can turn into something really bad. So, um, yes, I think there's some studies that are going to show uh, perhaps some benefit, but we have to be careful knowing that if, if I think everybody knows this, if they, they know anything about um, drugs like marijuana is that sometimes people have adverse uh, effects. Some people get more paranoid. Some people get more depressed. So you want to be careful um, and, and make sure you're doing the right thing for yourself. And talking about uh, the pandemic and the issues that have arose with that, um, one thing I came across, you know, as we are closing out because of running out of time, Mississippi ranks 44th for mental health workers, which means the need for mental health care professionals is outpacing the number of those needed to meet the demand, whether it's psychiatrists, psychologists, counselors, and so forth. How do we manage because the numbers are increasing, but the people available to treat it are going to be in such demand that there won't be enough to go around, it sounds like. You know, one area that I've worked in um, the last few years has been on workforce expansion. And, um, you know, we, we talk a lot about discovering um, who's in need, but then if you discover people are in need and then they don't have the services available, it, it doesn't seem to do a whole lot of good. So a couple of things I think we need to do is encourage um, individuals to go into this field, make it attractive for them, make sure that our pay scale is appropriate. And, and remember too, and, and I think um, it's been alluded to on this, is that often we, we don't need a psychiatrist. What we need are the, the therapists, social workers who are trained um, mental health therapists who are trained, uh, psychologists. We, 
I think we have to get away from thinking that always, though medicine is often in some cases needed, the majority, if we have the other support structures um, around, uh, you don't have to go to medication. And I saw some nods, so I'll step back because I want others to comment on this. Okay, Joy, I saw you nod your head. Yeah, I would, I agree with you. And I would take that even further. Um, and I know my answer to everything, almost everything tonight has been peer support. I'm going to throw that in here. No, too. That's wrong. There's a lot of ways that a peer support can, peer support person can help um, through navigating a lot of mental health issues where that higher end type um, intervention is doesn't end up being needed. And also things like supporting pediatricians in being able to treat um, some of these things on the front end. I know there's the CHAMP project in Mississippi for any, any medical care provider in Mississippi who sees children can call this line for free and talk to a child psychiatrist or a child psychologist and get a real-time consultation on how to treat that child in their office. That helps that child. They don't have to go out to a separate system. It also trains that pediatrician or nurse practitioner, whoever it is, um, to be able to do that with the next child. So really that's a very creative approach. We are never ever gonna have enough psychiatrists no. if we keep going with the models we have. So we need to change the way we think about it. Um, and that is actually one one that the champ and and mm -hmm. all, also our early childhood echo projects are um, hoping to come up with a sustainability measure so that we can these are both grant run now and we're hoping to be able to sustain those um, in the future with hard monies. But like you said, Joy, it, it really does empower primary care providers. To, to do more than just refer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, thank you for yeah. noting that. So those are really important. And then I think looking at how telehealth can be used, mm -hmm. that was tremendously important during the pandemic mm -hmm. and still can be. And then at the risk of offending every psychiatrist who might be listening, and I know one of them was texting me on how to get on here, um, looking at what can nurse practitioners do and what, within their scope of practice that sometimes people think only a psychiatrist can do. Right, there are mental health um, nurse pracs um, who, who have had specialized training and, and we certainly have those in our office. And so I don't think you're, you'll be um, offending most because uh, they can be awesome um, helpers in this area that extend services. Okay, Wendy, you were nodding your head, so I want to give you a chance to comment. I agree with. I mean, I agree with both of them. I think we have to we have to be looking at how we can build up the other areas because there's never going to be enough psychiatrists. But the majority of people don't don't need that level. I mean, the building up certified peer support specialists, like Joy said, and the role that they can play, um, the mental health therapists, the nurse practitioners. I mean, it, it's key to look outside of the box and other ways that we can provide the supports that people need, not that traditional line of thinking that we've always had. And I think that's okay, important. let's wrap up. I wanna get your final thoughts before we close out and we'll start with Susan Buttress, Dr. Susan Buttress. Yeah, closing thoughts. Um, I'll just say, I think it takes a team. I'm excited that MPB has gathered us together. And um, I will say that, that I am more hopeful than I've ever been in my 30 plus career, year career, uh, because I see so many uh, different entities sharing together. And Wendy, I cannot wait to hear more about the 988 um, number. That is awesome. You know, I think we're working uh, with a group uh, right now to help to expand um, all of the services so that we have a centralized resource um, for that um, parents and um, individuals can tap. So um, I just think we need to join hands and work together and know that the only way we can 
make a change is to do it together as a force. So yeah. thank you so much. Thank you. Joy Hogue. Um, well, I don't want anyone to forget about peer support. I don't think we will. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, I'm kind of making fun of myself, but I really mean that. And then I also think one thing we didn't talk a lot about tonight is it's going to be really important as we change our systems and move in these directions that we need to go to have data and mm -hmm. to have decisions guided by that. And we don't have a lot of data in the state. Like when you were asking questions about Medicaid, there's things, of, a lot of things we don't know Um as far as if people are, you know, getting on benefiting and all that kinds of things. So mm -hmm. I think that, and um, it's just going to be really important going forward. Okay. Wendy Bailey. I about to say ditto, but I mean, it, it, it absolutely is. The data piece is making decisions, looking at the data and looking at the numbers to see where we need to go is the only, I mean, it's the way that you should do it. Um, and then I, I love Dr. Buttress's comment about, you know, holding hands, all pulling the rope together, making the change together. Um, and I think it goes back to everybody being at the table and that absolutely includes people that are receiving the services and supports the people whose stories were highlighted um, at the first part of tonight and through this whole uh, four hour documentary that's aired over the last couple of weeks. I, I think that keeping that at the forefront and I think this is a great way to do it. All right, so Tanya Wembley. Well, Ms. Um, Desiree, what I would say is first, I really appreciate the documentary. I appreciate the, the way that it was filmed, the way that it was shared, because I often hear the stories. I listen to the individuals, but it's not often that the spotlight is given to them. It's usually someone else telling their story for them. So this documentary to me, it's a great start on what the state of Mississippi needs. And it leads right into what Joy has talked about, which is peer support. Um, even what Wendy said, thinking outside of the box, we have um, support groups, no charge, but it's peer led, literally. I mm -hmm. make it as a director and I can't go because it's peer led. So things like that make a huge difference. And with those groups, there are individuals who don't see therapist or psychiatrist, but they come to those groups and those peers can tell them and urge them, maybe you do need this help. Maybe you need a rap plan. You know, they give them advice and make sure that they stay well. If they fall off the wagon or someone hasn't seen them, there's a system in place to call them. So I think peers are very important. We need to, in the state, look at new ways to use our peers, expand what they are able to do and allow them to teach us how to support them in their journeys. Very good point. Thank you all for uh, what you've had to say. Well, we've come to the end of this virtual screening and discussion about mental illness. Thank you to our panelists. Again, Wendy Bailey, Mississippi Department of Mental Health, Dr. Susan Buttress with the University of Mississippi Medical Center, Dr. Joy Ho with Families as Allies, and Satanio, I apologize, Satanio Wembley with NAMI Mississippi. And we hope you'll join Mississippi Public Broadcasting again for future events. You will receive an email following tonight's event seeking your feedback and how to stay connected with us. Thank you again and have a good night.